Hi everybody, I thought it would be great if we were to do some practice questions and I decided we needed a guest for this. You remember him from the live I just did, Mr. Chris Barnett. Chris, say hello. Hello everyone, thanks for inviting me back Candace and for the moment I'm being distracted by my uh, puppy so uh, hopefully I can be of some value to you here. Oh, look, you want to take my puppy too? Because I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> well, if this is your first time with us, what we're going to be doing is just doing some questions. Chris and I have 10 questions that we want to go over with you that we're going to answer and kind of give you explanations. Not just, hey, this is the answer, but why is the answer what it is? So without further delay, let me start with our first question. Personal property can never be... Is it A, turned into real property, B, hypothecated, C, alienated, or D, none of the other options are correct? For, so for this first question, Chris, tell me, how would you go about answering this question? Okay, well, the way I'd go about answering this question, the first thing I'd do is go back and read the question and mentally underline a word. Because the first time I read this, I missed the word never. And I was like, this question makes no sense. But personal property can never be. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rule out the ones that are possibilities. So A says, can never be turned into real property. Well, we know that's not true. Because personal property can be attached to real property. And then it would become what we know as a fixture. So I could rule out A. And I think uh, it's important to remember that not only can personal property become part of the real property as a fixture, you might have real property like a tree, you know, because that's part of real property. If you sever it, if you cut down that tree, that log then becomes personal property. So personal property can become real property. If you sever something from the real property, it can become personal property. So it doesn't work because like you said, we're looking for the never. Personal property can never be. And yeah, sometimes it can be turned into real property. Tell me what you got on B. Now, when we talk about uh, hypothecation, I think about it as giving up something as collateral for debt while still being able to use it. Uh, this is something as simple as your car. Uh, you know, I have a note on my car, but I still get to use it. I owe someone for that. Now, once I pay them off, I'll get the title to that uh, car. But until that time, I've given it up as collateral for a uh, debt while I'm paying the uh, note. So technically, personal property could be hypothecated as well. Yeah. I like the hypothecation. I think it's one of those fancy words you can trot out at a dinner party that makes you sound so smart. But what we're saying is, hey, I'm using this car or this house as collateral, but I still get to keep it. I still That's get right. to have it in my possession. And you know, the opposite of this always makes, makes me think of Pawn Stars or those TV shows where they talk about pawn shops. But if you drop something off at the pawn shop because you need money, you get the opposite of hypothecation. I don't know what that <laughs> is, but you leave, you want to turn in, you want to pawn a piece of jewelry, you don't get to leave the store with it. So I don't, I don't know why. That just always makes me think of that. But I'll say C, alienated. I know alienation means to, to, to give it to somebody else, to, to give it away, to not be a part of it anymore. So the statement, personal property can never be alienated, is a false statement. Of course you can give property to personal property to somebody else. I mean, we would be in a real hurt in this world if we couldn't sell. I mean, we're capital capitalistic society. What can I say? So I kind of think, Chris, that leaves us with D if they all agree with us because none of our other options were correct. Yeah, and typically on the exam, you're not going to get one that uh, D is going to be none of the other uh, options. However, having said that, it's the same effect. If we roll out A, B, and C, the answer has to be D. And if you rolled out all of them, go back and read the question over again because you, you didn't them. get it. <laughs> That's right. All right. Breaking down the question is all the difference in the world when we're getting it right. How many times would you say, Chris, you've got students that know the information but struggle with how to answer the questions? Well, uh, that does happen a lot, but that's a, that's just a matter of growth. You know, the first thing is to learn the content, and then it's to learn the strategies around it. And that's what we're talking about now, our strategies. Our strategies. All right, number two. If a borrower defaults on a mortgage, the acceleration clause permits the lender to... I'll read it one more time. If a borrower defaults on a mortgage, 
The acceleration clause permits the lender to, is it A, force the borrower to vacate the premises, B, report the borrower to FHA, C, demand immediate payment of the entire note, or D, confiscate the borrower's personal assets. So for this one, I think if we can define or kind of look at the question and what it's talking about, that might help us answer. Sometimes it's really helpful if you come in and answer it on your own before you get confused by all the other, all the other answer choices. So it says defaults on a mortgage, the acceleration clause permits the lender to. So Chris, just in case they don't know, what is your definition of the acceleration clause? When I think of acceleration clause, I think of the word accelerate. So in other words, notice what you did here. Uh, I made a promise to the bank that I would pay them back over 30 years. I have 30 years to make payments to the bank. However, if I miss payments, then the bank is going to say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to accelerate this note to the end. Chris, you broke, you breached, you defaulted on the uh, loan. And so we're going to accelerate it or speed it up to the end. You now owe us everything. So you're speeding up the payment dates. So you would have had up to 30 years to pay it off. And now you have no years. Pay me today. That's right. That's right. right. I'm paying so, the whole loan off. So the question actually kind of actually defines a lot because the acceleration clause talks about if you default, you're speeding up the due date. So we right. kind of have to see if one of those answers match. So is it force the borrower to vacate the premise premises? I don't remember you saying anything about that. I don't, it doesn't sound like an acceleration clause to me. What about you, Chris? Nope, nope. Nope. Report the borrower to FHA. Where, where'd FHA come from? Don't read more into the question. <laughs> we we don't need FHA. Right. Demand the immediate payment of the entire note. Ding, ding, ding. That sounds exactly like what Chris was describing, but we got to still look at D. Confiscate the borrower's personal assets. Yeah, we didn't talk about that either. So I think that means, according to Chris, our answer has to be C, demand immediate payment of the entire note. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, as, as much as we make about deconstructing the uh, question, every once in a while, you're going to see one that you're perfectly confident in. And the, uh, uh, the clauses in a deed of trust or mortgage just happen to be an area that I have uh, photographic memory of what the answers are, of what the definitions are. And so when I looked at this, I automatically knew C. Now, I still went back and ruled the others out. But having said that, uh, don't, don't be surprised through your studies if every once in a while you get one and go, wow, that's exactly what I know that word matches up with. All right, let's do number three. Stephen, his nephew, and his niece are joint tenants. Stephen sells his interest to his sister, and then his nephew dies. As a result, which of these statements is true? And I'm going to read that one more time because I know sometimes people listen to us and they're on the road, they're in their car. So let's, let's hear that one more time. Stephen and his nephew and his niece are joint tenants. Stephen sells his interest to his sister and then his nephew dies. As a result, which of these statements is true? Is it A, the nephew's heirs and Stephen are joint tenants, but the sister is a tenant in common? Is it B, Stephen's niece and sister are joint tenants? Is it C, Stephen's niece and sister are tenants in common? Or is it D, the nephew's heirs are joint tenants with Stephen and his sister? Now, before we even get into you having to answer this, Chris, one thing I will say is whenever I get these, which of these is true, which of these is false, all of these are true except Whatever the question is, I like to break it down into something like there's either going to be three false and one true one. Maybe there's three true and one false. But I like to note that just on the piece of paper, 3T, 1F, 3F, 1T. That way I can go question by question or I should say answer by answer and decide, is it a true statement? Okay. Now, before, you, uh, before I answer this question, uh, I'm going to go back to what you just said. Uh, what I do with questions like this is not only use the, the three faults, one true in this case, but I always have to draw it out, Candace. I got to be honest with you. I guess it has a little bit to do with my ADD or something, but I literally have to uh, draw this out. 
Okay. Okay. So I'm going to write this out. So you've got Stephen. I'm going to call him ST. And then you have the nephew. I'm going to call him the nephew. And then I have the niece. So when I think about this, we have person A, we have person B, we have person C, and they are joint tenants. And that's important because we know joint tenants comes with the right of survivorship. And that right of survivorship means just in general, if somebody were to die, then the remaining owners get their share. Because Chris, what is it that has to be there if you're going to be a joint tenant? If you want to be joint tenant, what do we have to prove? Now, it, joint tenancy has to be actually written in the deed. I'm not sure if that was exactly the answer you were looking well, for. Well, no, there's three tenant, qualifications that you are four qualifications oh, you're, you have to you're have. You're looking for the, the, the unities of title. Yep, the unities. Yeah. Okay, for a joint tenancy to exist, there has to be unity of possession, interest, time, and title. Possession, interest, time, and title. Exactly. If you want to be joint tenants, then all four of these things have to be there so that you can have the right of survivorship. And if you don't have these four things, then you can't be a joint tenant, and then you're not going to get the right of survivorship. So when they got this property, Stephen, the nephew, and the niece, they have joint tenants tenancy and they have the right of survivorship but then the question says that Stephen sells to his sister so now you have the sister plus the niece and the nephew now what happens Chris when he sells to the nephew and the niece well by selling to the sister and this is why I like to draw this out you can see that clearly the sister was not part of the original conveyance Mm -hmm. So therefore, she was not on the same title at the same time. So for one thing, she can't be a joint tenant with the nephew and the niece. Mm -hmm. So she is now a tenant in common. And these two are still joint tenants. Exactly. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter that Stephen sold to the sister. That's great. If something happens to the nephew or the niece, they still have joint tenancy with the right of survivorship and the other partner, other person would get their share. But now the sister is a tenant in common. So if something happens to the sister, it would go to her heirs. Correct. But if I look back at the question, it says Stephen sells his interest to his sister and then his nephew died. So because the nephew died, he no longer belongs here and his interest goes to the niece. So now it's just going to be the sister and the niece. And they are going to be tenants in common. Because you pointed out that because she got it at a later time, she did not get title on the same document. And it wasn't at the same time. Anything you want to add to that? Well, I was just going to say, notice again that when the nephew died, it went to the surviving joint tenant, okay? And the niece was the only one that shared that status, okay? And then once it was only the sister and the niece left, there was no one left for the niece to be joint with. So it defaulted to tenants in common, which is kind of the default category. Now, you did not ask this uh, question, mm -hmm. but now that they're tenants in common, if either of them were to die, it would go to their heirs. But that's not the quite the question was. The question ultimately is, let's read the final question. As a result, which of these statements is true? Now, Candace, can we get back to the actual options? Yeah, let me make that question big for us again. And okay. so when we look at it, let's see. Now we know an answer. We figured out that when the nephew died, it just left the niece and the sister. So, and they were tenants in common. And we see here that only one of those answers matches that. And that is C, Stephen's niece and, si and sister are tenants in common. So in this no. instance, when we answered the question, I think it was helpful that we didn't read all the other answer choices first. We kind of answered the question in our head because we knew joint tenancy. We kind of worked out the scenario that we knew 
And then we found the answer that matched what we absolutely knew. Because sometimes in questions like this, I think the answers can confuse you. They start, you got so many people, you got so many things happening. But what do you think? Yeah, I was going to say, let's talk about that confusion. Now that we know what the answer is, let's talk about that confusion and talk about why this, these can't be correct. And look how the answer, uh, the question writer tried to trick you. The nephew's heirs, they tried to trick you into thinking that uh, once the uh, uh, joint tenancy was broken with the sister, it tried to trick you into thinking that the same thing would happen to the nephew. But that was not true. You could see that from the drawing. And then look at B. B is almost exactly the same answer as C except the way they ended it. So they put joint tenants in there, but after Candace's explanation, you see, of course, that joint tenancy is not a possibility for the niece and the uh, sister. And then D, the nephew's heirs are joint tenants with Stephen and the uh, sister. That can't possibly be the case because the sister was never going to be able to enjoy uh, joint uh, tenancy. So I, I like the way you drew that one up. Uh, well, you know, anytime I draw out stuff like that, I like to think to um, one of the charts. Now, this is a chart for tenancy in common, but I like to look at joint tenancy. I like to look at joint tenancy and say, okay, if I had A, B, C, and D as joint tenants, what happens if somebody dies and what happens if somebody sells? And that's what this chart is showing. We can see that if you had A, B, C, and D as joint tenants, obviously they all own 25%. They had to meet that possession, that interest, that title and time. But if A were to die, B, C, and D all evenly soak up A's 25%. So now B, C, and D all own 33 and a third percent. But if you have B, C, and D, and D is like, no, I'm out of here, and he sells to Q, Q becomes a tenant in common, and B and C stay in joint tenancy. So if something were to happen to B and C, then the other surviving person. So if C died, B would own 66%. But if Q dies, it goes to Q's heirs. Q's 33 and a third percent goes to Q's heirs because Q was a tenant in common because Q got title on a different deed at a different time. Did, does that chart kind of make sense to you, Chris? Yeah, it absolutely uh, does. And, you know, uh, well, you know this, Candace. Students always say this stuff is so confusing. The problem is that students try to turn themselves into attorneys on uh, this. At the end of the day, uh, these questions are all going to be based around the fact of what happens when someone dies, what happens when someone sells. If you can just kind of concentrate these tendencies around that, you're going to have it uh, 100%. Awesome. I agree. All right, let us go to our next question. Here we are. For a deed to be valid, it must. Oops. Well, there I go. I gave away the answer. Chris, I'm just going to go back. We're going to go back on that one first. Let me just hit that back button there for a second. <laughs> Take two. Take two. For a V. Take three. <laughs> For a deed to be valid, it must, is it A, be recorded, B, be executed by the grantor, C, be acknowledged, or D, be sealed by the grantee? So, Chris, in a question like this, where does your brain go to try to answer it? You know, in the uh, chapter on deeds, there are going to be certain things that you need to know, and among those things are going to be the essential elements of a valid deed, and so from that standpoint, it could you could just treat it as a memorization uh, point. You remember the central elements. Uh, I don't remember them right now. I can't. So oh, I, I just got you. Them out. If you don't remember them off the top of your head, I got you. Because remember, I do. If only you had a chart list. for that, yeah. right? I, I always, you know, I have a list. This one's from my essential list, but we have it right here. The essential elements of a deed. I like to remember it as I get paid with every deal. The uh the deed has to be in writing. The grantor has to be competent. There has to be a property description. There has to be words of conveyance. There's got to be words that say, hey, I'm giving you a property. You can't just say my name, your name, and an address. I don't know if you're inviting me over for burgers. I mean, I don't. we got to have some words that say, what is this piece of paper for? 
It has to be executed. And by executed, I mean signed by the grantor, not the grantee that has to sign, but the grantor. And then it needs to be delivered and accepted by the grantee. So I get paid with every deal. So when I see questions like this, I like to think back to my acronym, my you know, mnemonic device, I guess it's not really an acronym. And if I can remember that, then it helps me come up with the answer. And when I pull up the answer, I can see our question says, for a deed to be valid, it must be recorded, be executed by the grantor, be acknowledged or sealed by the grantee. The only one that matches that would be B. And so that's what I'm going to choose. That's the answer. It must be executed by the grantor. Um, the way you have this question uh, written is almost exactly the way that you, if you see this for test purposes, it's almost exactly like this. You may not have noticed it on Candace's list, but she had a list of essential elements and then she had non-essential cool. elements. I can go back so, to that here. Let me so that make it easy for them. So I do, I do have some non-essential elements. And this one is about me. A diva can shop with riches. Tell them what that stands for, Chris. Well, you can see the list there that uh, when we talk about these non-essential uh, elements here, almost all of these will show up in a deed. And that's why it's so confusing to our students. A deed will be acknowledged. That just means it'll be notarized. Uh, the first thing the notary is going to do when they notarize it is date it. So it's also going to be dated. Uh, the consideration will be, uh, there will be consideration, but it won't be named in the uh, deed. So that's a non-essential element there uh, as well. And then you jump all the way down to recording. Every deed you ever deal with is going to be recorded, I promise you that, but not because it's an essential element. It's because of an act in the state of North Carolina referred to as the uh, Connor Act. So if you notice when we go back to that uh, question, that you will see that what they did is they just simply pulled the wrong answers from the non-essential uh, elements. I promise you, if you go over this three times and you understand what I just said, you're going to be 100% on that question. Exactly. They tried to trick us with things that seemed essential, but they're not. And then if you can use those acronyms, guys, that's what they're there for, to help you when you get to these questions that seem tricky. If you can just go back to those acronyms, a diva can shop with riches. I get paid with every deal and all of the other acronyms that there are so many in this class that can help. This is the difference between passing and failing. Just little details like that. But I can think I we're good on thing? that. Go ahead. It won't, it, this will be quick. Uh, don't forget your ORs and your EE. The oh, OR yeah. is always giving something. The EE is always receiving something. The only one that has to sign is the grantor, the giver, the seller. And you're like, well, why don't you just make my life, life easier and say seller? Well, keep in mind, you don't just have to uh, sell a property. You could give a property away. That's why they use the word grantor instead exactly. of seller. Exactly. Yay. All right. Question number five. Let us keep on going. The term for a contract in which all parties have fulfilled their promises is a or an. The term for a contract in which all parties have fulfilled their promises. Is it an expired contract? an executed contract, a finished contract, or an executory contract? Chris, what say you about this question? You know, it's kind of interesting the way that I would attack this question is that uh, uh, expired contract and finished contracts really don't bubble up in my vocabulary that much. So I immediately went to executed and executory because I knew I'd seen those in my vocabulary uh, list. And I knew basically what they meant. So executory means a contract that is currently uh, pending some contingencies or something to that. In other words, all the contingencies have not yet been fulfilled. But definitionally, an executed contract is literally exactly what that question is. You get very few of these. However, I will say in the contract chapter, you're likely to get a lot of very specific questions because contracts are designed to be specific as opposed to not. So, uh, Candace, on this one, I went directly to my vocabulary, executed contract. And so executed contract is our right answer. Executed. I mean, I'm exactly there with you. I didn't recognize expired contract or finished contract. That's not formal. And the question is asking me for the term. It's not telling me to describe it. There is a word for it. And that exact word is executed. But I do want to point out, in this question, we said executed means that it's been fully performed. 
right? All the parties have done what they were supposed to do, but then we just gave them a list of the essential elements of a deed and we said executed means it needed to be signed. And guys, I hate to break it to you, that's just them the breaks in the real estate terminology. Like kind of like the word read or read. They're spelled the same word, the same way. It's the same word, but you kind of have to look at the at the context clues. And so in this case, if we're talking about executory, executory versus executed, executory means it's being fulfilled and executed means it's finished. But if we're talking about the signing of the deed, basically by signing, you're saying, hey, yes, it is yours. You're, ex you're executing, you're giving that signature. So it's just, I don't, I don't even know if there's an easy way to fix that problem. Chris, have you ever found a way to figure it out besides it's just, it is what it is? Uh, you know, the fortunate thing is there's very few occasions when this come up, but I think it's completely legit. And, and by the way, when you're studying, many of you may be taking online classes where you don't have the benefit of having uh, an instructor present. If you have the op uh, opportunity to jump into uh, review sessions or somewhere where you can have a conversation, you're like, hey, didn't I see this word executed come up before? Then the instructor can help guide you to why you're seeing that. But that's a great point, uh, Candace. And, and unfortunately, sometimes I don't even think about it because I know the definition so well that um, I, I forget about the fact that it's used in a different context. I mean, that's why we do this. So people can ask us questions or we can point out these things to our students. All right, let's hit number six. Chris, you want to read this one? Yeah. When private property is abandoned, by which of the following methods may the state acquire title? Is it A, adverse possession, B, eminent domain, C, dedication, and D, escheat? Ooh, and, this is a and, hard one. Can I answer it? Because this is one of my yeah, favorite gonna, questions. And by the way, let's be completely transparent here. Uh, and going over these questions, I asked Candace what the best way to attack this was, and she's going to give you the exact same answer she gave me. Yes, because knowing how to attack these questions, guys, that's why we're doing it. Lots of people can say, here's the answer, but how did we get to that answer? Kind of like math. We're showing you the steps behind the problem. So when I look at this question, I see the words private property and abandoned as being important as well as the state. So you got private property being abandoned and then the state is going to acquire title. Well, now when I look at the answers, I want to look at what the answers really truly mean. Remember, guys, I'm always saying the devil is in the details and it is in the details of these particular definitions of all the answers where you get the right answer. For example, adverse possession. Adverse possession is the idea that if somebody uses your land and meets the criteria of, o of ocean, open, continuous, exclusive, adverse, and notorious, another uh, acronym for you there, guys. If they meet that criteria, so if Chris is using my property, meets all the criteria of ocean, he could take me to court and the courts could say that is his property now. My Being my property, it is private, but Chris isn't the state. The state doesn't take property through adverse possession. So that's not going to be the answer because no, the state doesn't acquire through adverse possession. With the state takes property, they take it through eminent domain. They take it through eminent domain, but I got to tell you, I don't think eminent domain is the answer because of that word abandoned. If the state takes your property it, because it's abandoned, that means you're not using it anymore. And eminent domain is when they take somebody's property who's using it. And remember, they're paying them full market value for it. You don't get a choice. So it's not that they're taking it because it's been abandoned and eminent domain. They're taking it for the good of the public, not because it's abandoned. So I have to cross off that answer. We'll see dedication when you talk when you're talking about dedication that's when people are giving property to the state to be used usually for like a park or something like that so if i own a piece of property i could look at the city and say hey city i think you should totally use this for a park so dogs can play i'm giving it through dedication so once again the property wasn't abandoned which leaves us with the answer of d a sheet and i like that answer 
Because in a sheet, we know that means if you die without a will and you have no heirs, the property's been abandoned. Nobody's taking care of it. I don't have any heirs, so they can't take care of it. I'm dead, so I can't take care of it. It's been abandoned. It's been left by its on its own. So yes, by definition, if you die without a will and without heirs, that property's been abandoned, and now the state takes ownership, making our answer, in fact, D. So what do you think about that, Chris? Well, what I want to say again is just telling on myself on that. When I saw the question, I didn't like the question. I tried to talk about, let's twist this in a different way. Normally, when I see the word is cheat, I have a linear thought process on that. And my thought process is, that's what happens when you die without a valid will and without heirs in a sheets to the state. But the point that Candace made on that is, don't fight the question. The question is what the question is. You're not going to change it. And then with just a few simple thoughts, she was able to talk me into why not only it was the right answer, but also why it was a good question. Yeah, because it's it can't be the other answers. Even if Correct. Chris doesn't love the answer D, he knows it can't be A, it can't be B, and it can't be C. So I like it. And guys, I want to say this. Remember, these are practice questions. I just got these from someplace. No practice question will ever be perfect. But if it allows you to have a discussion, if we are able to remind you what adverse possession is, what eminent domain is, what dedication is, that's when you, you're studying. That's when you're learning. Taking practice questions isn't just about right or wrong. It's about why is it right? Why is it wrong? And just expanding your knowledge base. So let's expand some more and move on to number seven. A licensee stating the house has the prettiest yard in town is most likely an example of, and I'll read it one more time. A licensee stating the house has the prettiest yard in town is most likely an example of A, puffing, B, misrepresentation, C, fraud, or D, uninspired creativity. Now, Chris, I'm just going to say it. I like answer D, but just because it makes me laugh. <laughs> it just makes me laugh. That just If I was an artist, I'd be so offended. Uninspired creativity. But I think we can eliminate D. I'm going to go ahead and eliminate D for us. You talk to us about A, B, and C. Well, fortunately for me on this one, puffing is my favorite word in uh, real estate. Are you trying so to I tell us something that... about your, your, your activities in the evening, Chris? Is that what you <laughs> It's a fun word. Puffing's a fun word. But it, the definition of puffing is just an exaggeration for effect, a subjective opinion. And so by knowing that, and by saying it's the prettiest yard in town, I, it, it's not going to be a misrepresentation or a fraud. Those are going to be more objective standards that you're going to judge by. But uh, puffing, you hear this all the time. Real estate agents are creative about it. I oftentimes think that when you become a real estate agent, you get a book about puffing quotes. So you can say the best view in town or the prettiest foyer or something to that it's effect. Something like it's a great for a um, ooh, cozy. They'll say it's cozy there or great yep. for the, you, the weekend handyman. Like it's just a way to kind of say something. Yeah, yeah. What does the uh, um, what does Ellen say about that? Cozy means small. Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, what's the other one that uh, uh, that she uses? Uh, uh, but anyway, she, go watch it. Anyway, she's got a whole video about how real estate agents oh, uh, use words. <laughs> she does. So we're gonna go with puffing. We know that's puffing. the answer because misrepresentation and fraud are both lies. And puffing is just a statement of somebody's opinion. And that agent's opinion, it is the prettiest yard in town. I could think it's differently. It doesn't make one of us wrong. It just means it's our, our, our exaggeration of a belief. Not a lie, which would be misrepresentation and fraud. All right, let's try number eight. A non-possessory interest in real property is also known as... A non-possessory interest in real property is also known as, is it A, a less than freehold estate, B, a license, C, an easement, or D, an appurtenance? Now, Chris, I'm thinking the best way to answer this is to go through the definitions of the answer choices and see which one fits our question. So tell me what you know about a less than freehold estate. Well, uh, there are freehold estates and there are none. 
freehold estate. So you may see the word non up there and say, okay, well, the lessee freehold estates are non freehold, but non freehold just means you don't uh, own it, like your leasehold uh, estates. So non freehold equals leasehold, and this has nothing to do necessarily with a lease. So I'm kind of putting that one to the side a little bit. Uh, in regards to a licensing, that is a license is just letting somebody do something. When you think about a license, you know, you think about the fact that you allowed someone uh, to do a thing like hunt on your land. You didn't really give them anything except the ability to walk on your land and uh, hunt. So it's not really an estate in I the like, uh, property. Yeah, I like to think of a license. You don't have an interest in real property. Correct. That's why licenses aren't encumbrances. If I give Chris a license to cross my land or hunt on my land, he doesn't get a say in my real property. So a license is not an encumbrance, and this is an encumbrance. Is, it's something bigger. This is talking about a non-possessory interest, and if you have a license, you don't have an interest in my real property. So. All right. Now, as it turns out, I think C is the answer, and I think that the definition of an easement is very close to what you see there, so I'm going to go with my definition. And then I'm going to go down to a pertinence just to rule out D and make sure that I haven't uh, overlooked anything. And uh, going back to my definitions, I know that a, a pertinence is a right or privilege that runs with the land. And a pertinence as, is actually an interest in uh, property. And so having said that, I can kind of rule a pertinence out and go back to my definition. I'm going to go with C on this one, Candace, unless I miss something. And you didn't miss anything as far as I can tell. It is C and easement. So I love, well, you know what, Chris, before we talk about it, an easement we know is the right to use or cross somebody's land. And just remind people, what are our two different types of easements? Well, there are going to be a pertinent easements and easements in gross. Mm -hmm. And Candace, I don't know how deep you want to go down this path, but... Maybe we'll leave it there, but I guess just say, you know, a pertinent easement is where you have one property crossing another, and then our easements in gross are either utility easements or a personal easement to cross somebody's property. But I do know I have a video on that, and you know what? We could make another video at another time breaking down some easements for them. If they want that, yeah. just let us know in the comments. Well, for the uh, students, it's so interesting the way you were able to break down what the uh, uh, what the easements are, because, again, it's a spot in class where people raise their hands and like, I just don't get this. And my response is you're overthinking it, guys. Let's not try to become attorneys on this. Let's just really focus on a pertinent easement. There has to be two parcels of land involved. But with the easement in gross, it's a parcel of land that is being encumbered by a person or personal easement, which would include like utility companies. Mm -hmm. All right, number nine, a promissory note, and then we've got to finish this sentence. A promissory note, is it A, is the primary evidence of title transfer? Is it B, is not valid until recorded? Is it C, is negotiable? Or is it D, is the instrument that creates collateral? Hmm. Hmm. Where do we want to start on this one, Chris? Well, let's start at the top. Let's just go ahead and, uh, again, the, one of the most important things you can learn about these questions, and a lot of people ask me, Candace, I've studied all the questions. How do I keep studying if I've already seen all the questions? Do I go out and buy a new database or what? You can actually learn from the questions you already have by just simply defining what the off answers are. So in this particular case, I look at A as the primary evidence of title transfer, I need to relate that all the way back to the deed. The deed is not a promissory note. They are two separate definitional uh, answers. And if you know what the, de the, the deed is, you can rule out A. And I like to say that A, I would say that A is the right answer to a different question. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's the right answer, but not to this. A is the answer to what is a deed? A, a deed is the primary evidence of the title transfer, not a promissory note. So it is a right answer, but not here. It's the wrong answer in this case. <laughs> so great there point. You go. Great point. And you know, B is kind of uh, interested because when you talk about the uh, uh, the promissory note, the promissory note is the IOU. And I want you to think about your, your car, uh, for example. Uh, Candace used this earlier. If you buy a car and borrow money, then you sign a promissory note. It's your promise to repay a debt. But they don't record that note, do they? And the same thing happens in real estate. The IOU, they don't record. What they do record is the lien, the collateral, but not that. 
Yeah, I mean, you. I could write you. Look, let me change my words. You could write me a promissory note where you owe me $5,000, Chris, and <laughs> we don't have to have it recorded. If we want to be protected by the law, if we want to make sure that everything goes through, we might talk about recording it, but it doesn't have to be recorded in order to be valid. So B is not our answer. Now, you've got C is negotiable. And I think this is a hard one to answer if you're not quite sure what negotiable means. And what I know is that when we say a promissory note is negotiable, we're not talking about you're negotiating the interest rate for payback. We're talking about can you use it as money? You know what the other things are negotiable? Checks are negotiable. Um Poker chips are negotiable. Like these are things you could turn in if it's a poker chip to the casino, a personal check to the bank, and you can use it like cash. You can exchange it for cash. You know what's not negotiable? Like a coupon. If Chris had a coupon for $3 off a box of Cheerios, he cannot go to the front desk and be like, I don't want the Cheerios, but I want my $3 because coupons are not negotiable. You can't use them as cash. So a promissory note, is it negotiable? I think so. In fact, I know so. I know that promissory notes are negotiable, but before I say final answer, I'm gonna have Chris check out answer D to see if he likes that one. All right, and uh, D again goes back to what I was suggesting just a moment ago, uh, is the instrument that creates uh, collateral. That would actually be the deed of trust or mortgage, depending on wherever you're watching uh, this uh, video. Um, so in other words, it's not the note that says you owe me the money. It's the fact that someone was able to put an encumbrance on your property in the event that you didn't. So that would be more akin to the deed of trust or the mortgage instrument. I agree. So I think we're going to go with our answer is C, yes? And yes. it is. Woot, woot, we're getting it down. We're getting it down. All right. All right let me two. mention oh, Let me ahead. mention one other thing before we uh, leave that one. Um, I, historically, I said that uh, finance is an area where you get a lot of questions. And uh, um, it used to be, Candace, that on finance, it was almost always definitional. In other words, if you knew the definitions, you were going to do fine. But it seems like what I found recently is that it's not just a definition. It's one or two drill downs. And the drill downs are what I mean by what Candace was talking about just a uh, moment ago. Understanding not only what it means to be negotiable, but also take it a step farther and give some examples of that. And I will tell you this, in the finance chapter, the fact that notes are negotiable is the whole way that the secondary market works. Oh. If notes were not negotiable, the secondary uh, market would not work. Exactly. All right, you ready for number 10, Chris? Number 10, let's see it. A listing contract in which the broker's commission is contingent on the broker being able to produce a buyer before the property is sold by the owner or another broker is called. Let me answer it. Read that one more time. A listing contract in which the broker's commission is contingent on the broker being able to produce a buyer before the property is sold by the owner or another broker is called. Well, is it an open listing, a net listing, an exclusive agency listing, or an exclusive right to sell listing? And I think once again, if you know your definitions, and I know people are always saying this, definitions, vocab, vocab, definitions, know your vocab, know your vocab. Well, when you get questions like this, if you know your vocab and you know what all these answer choices mean, you just find the one that matches the answer or that you match the answer to the question. So, Chris, let's start with you. Tell me what an open listing is. Well, an open listing agreement, first of all, it's rare in a lot of places, but don't, don't think just because it's rare doesn't mean they won't ask you a test question on it. For example, in our area, an open listing means that basically what the seller has told an agent is, yes, you can list my property, but I'm only going to pay you if you bring me a buyer. However, if eight agents walk by today and ask me the same question, I'm going to list with them and tell them the exact same thing. So an open listing, the seller is saying, if you bring me a buyer, I will pay you. But keep in mind, I'm going to say that to every other agent. And if I sell it myself, I owe you nothing. Exactly. I like to think of it as I can do an open house if I'm the broker. And you could do an open house if you're the broker. And St. Nick can do an open house if he's the broker. But all of us can list the property. All of us can market the property. But only one of us that's getting paid is the one 
who finds the buyer. I could do 17 different open houses, but if you're the one that finds the buyer, Chris, you get paid and I get nada. All right, what do we know the definition of a net listing to be? Well, a net listing talks more about how you're going to get paid in a, a transaction. As a matter of fact, in your mind, you would want to have net listing compared to like a flat fee or a percentage of sale price. It talks more to how you're going to get paid. A net listing means that I'm going to receive, me as the agent, excuse me, I'm going to receive anything above the seller's net. They tell me they want to make 135 uh, net on the property and I end up selling it for 150 in theory I make $15,000 so that has to do more with how you're going to get paid yep I think that's great I was actually just pointing that out to students in class open exclusive agency and exclusive right to sell are types of seller agency like when do I get paid when do I not get paid who can sell it who can't sell it net listing is talking about how am I getting paid like am I getting paid because of a, a percentage or in a case of a net listing, I'm getting anything over a certain amount. So I love that you pointed that out. All right, so I'm gonna tackle exclusive agency listing. And I'm gonna tackle it with the answer D, exclusive right to sell, because I think they are so intertwined. Both of them have the word exclusive, and that's really important in how they differ from an open listing. Because in an open listing, Chris could do an open house and I could do an open house and St. Nick could do an open house. But in an exclusive agency or an exclusive right to sell, only one broker is the marketing slash listing broker. One broker, one firm, one company is the company that is helping that seller find a buyer. Like, well, I shouldn't say find a buyer. Let me be more specific. They are marketing or listing that property. One company, which is why open listing doesn't have the word exclusive in it. An exclusive agency, an exclusive right to sell. Only one company should be doing open houses. Only one company should have a sign in the front yard. Just one company. They're both exclusive. But where they differ is whether or not the agent is always getting paid or if there's a chance the agent won't get paid. Well, what do I mean by that? In an exclusive agency listing, there's one broker that's listing the property, but... If the seller finds the buyer themselves, then no matter what the work was that the broker did, they're not going to get paid. In an exclusive agency listing, you're giving a window for the seller to find the buyer and not owe that broker a commission. Different is the exclusive right to sell, which says, look, as the seller, it doesn't matter who finds the buyer. The buyer could be found by the broker who listed the property. The buyer could be found by a cooperating broker. The buyer could be found by the seller. The buyer could come down from outer space and be an alien. I don't know. But if a buyer is found, a ready, willing, and able buyer is found, or that seller decides to transfer it to somebody, then that listing firm is going to earn that commission. So in an exclusive right to sell listing, if there's a buyer, if there's going to be a new owner, the broker always gets paid. But in an exclusive agency listing, the broker would not get paid if the seller finds the buyer first. And that word first is what ties us back to the answer, back to the question, I should say. Our question says a broker's commission is contingent on the broker being able to produce a buyer before the property is sold by the owner or another broker is called. Does that make, I'm hoping that makes sense. Chris, did that make sense to you? It did. And it might be one of those type things that someone has to uh, read or study a couple of times, mm -hmm. but here's the good news about it. This question will show up on the exam. Now, I don't know if the answer will be open list and exclusive agency or exclusive right to sell, but understand that they're just going to take and put a little different scenario up there to make the answer different. But they always ask this question on the exam and you can completely get it. And it's an agency question, which means it's an important uh, question. So if you didn't understand uh, Candace's explanation, listen to it again or go to that part of the book. At the end of the day, it has to do with how that agent is going to get paid and are they competing against the owner and are they competing against the owner and other agents? And because they're competing against the owner and other agents, it's an open listing. Because remember, right. an exclusive right to sell 
or exclusive agency. They're not competing against other right. agents to get paid. And both exclusive agency and exclusive right to sell, if another agent gets finds the buyer, that listing firm is getting paid. So it's that they're trying to sell it before the owner and before another broker. That is why our answer is open listing. So Chris, that was 10 questions. What do you think? Did you think we, we covered a lot of information today? Yeah, we did. And uh, students, as you're studying this, uh, notice the way we broke the question down. Notice the way we related it to where the answer belonged. In other words, if it was the off answer, where did it also go with? And uh, Candace, here's one little tip that I have for people. It's, again, when you get to that point of study and you're like, what else could I do to make myself better on this topic? Practice writing your, these questions yourself. If you can write a good question, then you can understand a good question because you start thinking in terms of how are they going to try to trick me on the exam. Yeah, I love that advice. I love it. And it, it follows a lot, along with what I say. Don't just look at why the right answer is right. Look at exactly what makes the wrong answers wrong. Is the wrong answer a better answer to a different question? Or is there something pick, you know, it's just kind of picky about it? Like they use the wrong amount of years or different numbers, something like that, where we saw that question with about adverse possession and things like it's the little details. When you start to write questions, you start looking at those details, which is where a lot of these questions come from. So, Chris, unless you have something to add, I guess we'll just do this again for questions 11 through 20 sometime soon. Huh? All right. That uh, that sounds good. I really like this uh, format. And I hope the uh, hope you're getting a lot out of it. Yeah, guys, let us know what you think. And if you have a question, reach out to us. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye bye.